I wonder if I can um, call the meeting to the order and can I welcome everyone to this, the 22nd meeting of the Education and Skills Committee in 2018. May I also remind everyone present to turn their mobile phones and other devices to silent for the duration of the meeting. And we should note that Alistair Allen has given apologies. He will have to leave the meeting at one point to move some amendments in local government committee. Um, and that will happen at the time that he um, is aware of. So we note that for the record. Um, we have had a change of membership to the committee since the last meeting, and therefore the first item of business is an opportunity for the new members of the committee to declare any interest relevant to the remit of this committee. So I warmly welcome Claire Adamson, Alistair Allen, Jenny Gilruth and Rona Mackay to the committee. And can I invite um, Claire, first of all, to declare any interest? Um, I would just like to declare that I'm a board member of CERC. Alistair Allen. I draw people's attention to my, uh, my declaration of interests. Um, I don't think there's anything relevant or anything that derives me any remuneration, but I draw people's attention to my register of interest. Okay, thank you. Jenny? I draw people's attention to my register of interest uh, as a member of the General Teaching Council for Scotland. Okay, and Rona Mackay? No relevant interests. Okay, thank you all for that and welcome to the committee. May I also take the opportunity to record my thanks to all of those leaving the committee, James Dornan, George Adam, Richard Lockhead and Gillian Martin, for all the work that um, they did in contributing to the work of, of, of this parliamentary committee. And I think in particular I want to record my thanks to James Dorn and his convener, who, while we were dealing with very substantial and challenging issues, um, managed to do so in a way that I think pulled and held the committee together, which was very important, and I think showed a very interesting willingness to take the committee out beyond um, the committee chamber, the committee rooms itself, engaging actively with people who have an interest in education right across Scotland, and I wish him well um, in chairing the local government committee. We can move to the next item of business, which is the choice of convener. On the 1st of June 2016, the Parliament agreed to motion SM 5M sorry, 278, which resolved that members of the Scottish National Party are eligible to be chosen as convener of this committee. And I understand that Claire Adamson is the party's nominee for this post. May I ask someone to nominate Claire? Okay, thank you. Um, and a seconder. Okay. Um, do we agree to choose Claire Adamson as our convener? Agreed. Okay, in that case, can I congratulate Claire on her appointment? I look forward to working with you. And I'll now hand it over to you to do the hard bit of um, the job today. <laughs> <laughs> uh, thank you very much. Um, and I'm, I'm very pleased to be back on education education committee having served in the previous education and culture committee in the last session of the parliament and i'd just like to echo um, the comments of the deputy convener regarding the members who have gone on to new roles in the parliament and wish them well our next item uh, on the agenda is agenda item three um, and it's a decision whether to take agenda item five in private and whether to take consideration of the work program at, at the next meeting in private also um, can I have agreement from the committee? Thank you. Um, agenda item four is um, uh, the 2018 exam diet curriculum and attainment trends. And um, we, we're taking an evidence session on this this morning and uh, very pleased to welcome Dr. Alan Britton, Senior Lecturer in Education, University of Glasgow. Professor Jim Scott, School of Education and Social Work, University of Dundee. Dr. Marina Shapira, Lecturer in Quantitative Methods, University of Stirling, and Dr. Janet Brown, Chief Executive, and Alistair Wiley, Head of Technology, Engineering, and Construction Qualifications the Scot from the Scottish Qualifications Authority. And we have had an apologies this morning for Professor Louise Hayward, who um, is unable to be with us this morning. So um, I welcome the panel this morning. Um, we we did have some themes in our paper today, but I think we're going to um, just let members. Um, have questions um, once you've all had an opportunity to make some opening remarks and I would like to invite Professor Scott to lead off. Thank you very much. Good morning ladies and gentlemen. Um, it's something of a challenge to condense all that has happened in CFE into about three minutes but I'll do my best. Um, I have, I'm not going to attempt to read you my attainment evidence or, or my curricular evidence. You, you've seen that. What I would say to you is that I've drawn evidence by sieving every single school and local authorities documentary pile, the website, the paper, the lot. I have examined agency papers, government papers, and I've interviewed 100 of the governance actors in Scotland from this level 
to middle level head teacher and deputy head teacher. So it's by triangulation of a great deal of evidence that the conclusions in my paper arise. Um, curriculum for excellence is a very, very difficult thing for Scotland to achieve. It's a highly commendable thing for Scotland to achieve, and I spent many years of my professional life trying to do just that. It's worth noting that major initiatives tend to take 10 to 15 years to work through. And they tend to have been initiatives that covered two years of the secondary curriculum or aspects of the primary curriculum. We are actually attempting to improve the entire curriculum. One should expect, therefore, that there would be A, issues, and B, that it would take a significant period of time. I think what my evidence suggests is that there certainly are issues and that we are not yet at the end of the process by any means. If I look at the curriculum, um, I've looked at two parts of the curriculum. I've looked at the broad general education, S1 to S3, and I've looked at the senior phase, S4 to S6. Um, you have in your possession a cut-up version of this, which is a curriculum map of the entire Scottish S1 to S3 curriculum. It demonstrates beyond any shadow of a doubt that the things that Douglas Osler, when he was Her Majesty's Senior Chief Inspector of Schools back in the late 90s, told us not to do, have been implemented in flesh in Scottish schools. We have significant fragmentation of the curriculum, Taster courses have reappeared in many schools, despite the fact that HMI always warned us not to do this. Languages appear or don't appear. Um, I, I was hoping that I could smile at Dr. Allen because he and I have had many conversations about 1 plus 2. And the reality of the situation is that 1 plus 2 is by no means implemented in the BGE, although it should be. Um, approximately two thirds of Scottish schools more or less implement the, the 1 plus 2 process. Um, in the S4, 5 and 6 curriculum, the real problem lies in S4, but there is a subterranean problem there because much of the problem lies in the articulation of S3 and S4. And if you have tried to work your way through that curriculum map I supplied you with, you can see that articulation, uh, the, the idea that courses are coherent and progressive, which are things that CFE would wish them to be, this does not seem to be the case, because if I only look at the schools that are progressing towards six courses in S4, that happens with anything from eight courses to 24 courses in S1. No one would suggest that eight courses or 24 courses are an appropriate way to educate Scottish children. None of us would take that view, I suspect. That happens in S2 as well, but then in S3, there appears to be significant confusion within the profession, and that's backed up with interviews I've carried out recently and before. Because what happens in S3 is that any pattern in S1, S2, and they're often quite consistent, S1 and S2, any pattern in S1 and S2 leading to any one of these six cores, seven cores or eight cores models in S4, what one then finds as the progression route through S3 from that to that can be almost apparently random. Going in one block of schools that say do 16 courses and 16 courses in S1 and S2, you can have 12 to 15 different processes evident in Scotland for schools trying to track through to the next set of courses in S4. That's not something that we should support. We did away with the curriculum guidelines at the end of uh, the 1990s and replaced that with Circular 3 2001 and then Curriculum for Excellence. All of that allowed head, head teachers in communication with their school bodies to actually choose the curriculum. And what appears to be the case is that either school communities have made some very random choices or head teachers have made some very random choices. There is, of course, another layer there because some Scottish local authorities have chosen to mandate their schools to carry out a certain course structure. And one sees that evident in the map I supplied you with to show what happens in the S4 curriculum. Many of the local authorities in the north have opted for six courses. Most of the rest have opted for something else. The outcome is, uh, I think both um, the Spice paper and I produced numbers that demonstrate what's happening in S4 in Scotland just now. The latest, and I can tell you it's the latest, because I've just finished a survey of all 359 Scottish secondary schools again. The latest position is that 54% of Scottish secondary schools are offering their children uh, I'll carefully say only six courses. Um, approximately a third, slightly less than that, are offering seven courses. About an eleventh are offering eight courses. And there are still three or four hardy souls who are offering five courses. The problem there is in the detail for the child, because in the end, it doesn't matter tuppence what the curriculum structure is unless it meets the needs of the child. And the evidence demonstrates that the problem for many um, 
middle and upper ability range children is that their choice is being squeezed, particularly in the five and six course schools. Because if you're in a six course S4 school, what happens is that most children choose maths and English, understandably, and they then either choose two sciences and a social subject or two social subjects and a science, depending on what their particular aspiration is. And that leaves the entire remainder of the Scottish curriculum fighting for one column in these schools. Needless to say, much of what would have been a beneficial experience for these children in times past has gone. And that obviously has an impact then on attainment. Um, some of my critics have chosen to point out that I've focused on S4. And the only reason I've focused on S4 is that there was data for S4 sooner than there was for S5 and S6. It takes time for these things to work through. However, we'll leave that to one side. If I look at S4, the situation in S4 is that had things gone on as they were in 2013, and 2013 was not the strongest of the pre-CFE years, 2011 was stronger and 2010 was stronger, but if things had gone on as they were in 2013, a middling year, we would have had an extra 622,000 qualifications in Scotland over the five years since. I actually struggle to say that in a public forum. It's almost unbelievable. We have chosen to do something different, but that curriculum narrowing has both impacted significantly on the quantity of attainment, I'll come back to quality in a minute, has impacted significantly on the quantity of attainment, but it has also impacted on the progression pathways then available to children. Uh, I think most of you are probably aware that I'm an ex-head teacher uh, of several schools. And if I look at those several schools that had quite different catchments, in all cases, it tended to be the case that children who started off aiming for a particular thing frequently didn't end up doing that because things went wrong in exams and they had to have backups from some of their other subjects to pick up and move forward. We used to be able to assure children that those progression pathways were there. It's harder now. It's almost impossible in a five-course school. Um, anecdotally, one school in Scotland that chose to do five courses opted to do English, Gaelic native speakers and mathematics as mandatory subjects uh, for two years at the beginning of CFE and that left only two other subjects for everything else, which is a refined form of madness, I think I have to say. Um, clearly, if one moves on into S5 and S6, but the current mantra is that we should look at Weaver's attainment and I have no problem with that. Those of us who worked in schools and local authorities always looked at Weaver's attainment. There's nothing new there at all. The evidence suggests that things have continued to improve in terms of Weaver's attainment, and that's true. But if you actually look at the profile of what has happened with Weaver's attainment, Weaver's attainment grew quite strongly from the beginning of the recording of the data in 2009-2010, up to the point where we hit curriculum for excellence. And since then, Weaver's attainment has either grown much more slowly or it has plateaued, or in one case it looks <clears throat> like it may just be beginning to go down. If it is going down, that would be in line with what seems to be happening in the senior school. Um, level seven, advanced higher, progresses more or less smoothly. There have been a couple of little ripples, but those could be experimental error. There's no way of suggesting there's anything wrong there. And of course, that's probably not surprising because the most able children tend to survive changes of system most effectively they have all the additional benefits. The thing that concerns me most about both my curricular findings and attainment findings is that what seems to be happening is that those who are worst affected by curriculum for excellence are the lower end of the average group of children and the lower group of children. Now, I don't know a head teacher in Scotland or an educational researcher in Scotland who wouldn't subscribe to the concept of equity. That's something that education professionals spend their lives attempting to achieve. The evidence here suggests that equity is not being achieved and in fact, things appear to be getting somewhat worse. That's not a happy thing to say to a group of politicians because that's not what you want either. If I actually look at school-based evidence, um, I actually have, amongst the many things I didn't give you because I was aware there was a limit, uh, I actually have a profile of schools that still declare their attainment because one of the problems for a parent or a child involving themselves in this process, because we all understand that since 2001, it should be the case that parents and children are consulted about the nature of the curriculum they experience. The problem is that where schools actually declare their attainment, and that's not many of them, 
The pattern demonstrates that schools in less, uh, I'll, I'll use the word posh since I'm, I'm out of adjectives at the present moment. Schools in less affluent areas, since my brain has returned, generally are the ones whose attainment has gone down. And there are quite marked profiles among schools across Scotland in terms of what has happened. Some schools have allowed their level three, level four, level five attainment to rise and supported that in effective ways. Others have just gone along like that and there has been no change. And others have either gone down a bit or in a small number of cases have gone down quite significantly. And I, I know one of my colleagues later will talk about her findings in that context. So we have a problem that we do not seem to be achieving excellence, at least if attainment in S4 has dropped by 33.8% since 2013, and I find that number difficult to say in public again. And if equity appears to be being diminished rather than increased, it appears that we have a problem. There are three layers of problems, I would suggest, to conclude. One lies with the national process. Um, you might describe curriculum for excellence as, excuse me, I don't know why I have a dry mouth sitting in a political meeting. Um, you might describe um, curriculum for excellence as a process of four committees and two administrations. And the trouble is that the process has not been a smooth one. Um, I'm a mathematician, so I might be tempted to describe the process as orthogonal, and, but it might actually be worse than right angled. Because we had a national debate, a ministerial response to that national debate, a curriculum review group, a ministerial response to that curriculum review group, and then we went on to a curriculum um, board and then on to another curriculum board and the process of going from one to another is not smooth. I've been involved at the front edge of all the national developments since higher still, possibly the one before it to some extent. In all of those developments that have gone through, this is the one that has had the most random governance pathway nationally. If you then look at the situation where those bodies who are actually responsible for implementing this process of Scottish local authorities, I can say with some feeling as an ex-head teacher, an ex-local authority uh, officer on and off, that it has become harder and harder for Scottish local authorities to carry out those actions because their residue of highly experienced educationalists has diminished across the last 10 to 15 years. And then you have the school situation I don't know if you speak to head teachers a great deal, but one of the things I would say to you is that we would all commonly accept that not all head teachers are curricular experts. Head teachers all have quite different skill sets. And therefore, if there is no curricular guidance to guide head teachers, you must assume that they will do the best they can in the circumstances. Yes, they will meet the needs of their constituency as best they understand it. But I used to be the chairman of the Building Our Curriculum Self-Help Group, which is the only body in Scotland that has produced consistent exemplification of how curriculum for excellence can be implemented in secondary schools. My successor was a guy called Jerry Lyons in Glasgow, who I suspect you may have heard of, and the two of us have spent some considerable time trying to do exactly that, to support schools. One of the things we learned from holding national conferences year after year through the development process of curriculum for excellence is that head teachers claimed that they were uncertain, that they were not as well informed as they should be, that their colleagues were confused by going to different national meetings with different national agencies because some said one thing and some said another. I did a small resurvey before I came here today with some of my key witnesses just to check if they were still saying that sort of thing. And the response is, it's better, but there have been some recent changes that have re-sown some confusion. So I think from three fronts, from the curriculum, where there is fragmentation, narrowing, and in one or two cases, excess broadening, from the viewpoint of attainment, where we've seen a significant drop in fourth year and the beginnings of a drop by the looks of it in fifth year, and from the point of view of the ability of the various bodies in a school community to come together and actually improve things, there are challenges in all of these areas. They are not insurmountable, but I think my bottom line to you would be in line with that of OECD 2015, which suggested that there really should be a reconceptualization of CFE and to underpin that reconceptualization, because I remember my evidence to that committee, 
the idea that the CFE process and documentation and support materials should be worked through more effectively than it is at current. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Professor Scott. Could I uh, invite Dr Britton to make a contribution? Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, can I begin by thanking the committee for inviting me? Um, I'll try to indicate what I feel I can offer by way of my insights into the, the issues under consideration today. Uh, my analysis mainly stems from a long-standing research project that uh, I've been tracking the origins and evolution of uh, CFE more or less from the outset and indeed looking back to its precursors in the, the national debate that uh, Jim mentioned, but also uh, your predecessor committee's report, the Education, Culture and Sport Committee uh, inquiry in 2002, which in many ways is, is at least as interesting as the national debate when we look back at it because it explored the purposes of education. And I think that's the point we have reached again in the process where the, the, the issues that Jim has articulated today uh, take us back to that, uh, that starting point that we, we have perhaps lost sight of what it is that we are trying to do uh, through this process. Um, so in terms of the, the, the analysis that I've, uh, I, I would be able to present to you today, it's based on interviews with uh, senior policy actors who were involved in CFE from uh, the outset, uh, a lot of document analysis. And what I was really looking at was, you know, what are the underlying drivers of that process? Uh, what are the power dynamics between the different uh, stakeholders in the process? What's the balance of power, if you like, between the different uh, organisations? And uh, crucially, I think, in the context of today, that I've kept an eye on both the governance and the sequencing of the implementation process. You know, what, what, um, what follows from what in that sequence? And that, I think, actually turned out to be critical in reaching the point that we have uh, at the moment. Uh, so I've continued to monitor the ongoing evolution and I still engage regularly with practitioners uh, uh, and beginning teachers on how the system is adapting to CFE, this idea of policy translation from the original vision in 2004 to what we have today. Um, and drawing from this research, I've set out a number of short bullet points uh, in my submission, and I think that's Annex A to the, in the papers today. And I won't repeat all of them here just now, but I hope that some of the following observations might help to frame the discussion uh, this morning. Firstly, uh, the issues under consideration, I think, are uh, they emerge as unintended but inevitable consequences of the way that Curriculum for Excellence was conceived and implemented. Um, you know, I, I, I don't think anyone has consciously set out to create the, you know, the rather chaotic pattern of provision that uh, Jim has outlined across all the different schools and, and local authorities. Uh, so it, it's accidental in its, in its nature, but still inevitable. Um, so, for example, in relation to the assessment and qualifications, there was a, a conscious policy decision made around 2004 uh, that sought to delay the, 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 the thorny issues around uh, certification. You know, you had, on the one hand, a particular vision of education presented in the review group report, which was not uh, a good fit for the um, the assessment and qualifications regime as existed at the time. And so with that conscious delay, it meant that there was no real opportunity, uh, or it meant that the, the, the problems were simply uh, delayed and there was no opportunity then to do piloting to actually work through some of the inevitable problems that would emerge. Um, so, and we're left with the legacy of that uh, today. So what we tend to find now is, uh, and I think the picture that Jim describes is, is really important here, schools and school leaders are having to retrofit solutions to uh, the nature of the, the policy, uh, the architecture that we're, we're left with. Um, so, and, and the decisions that they are making uh, are not necessarily educational decisions. Uh, and I think that's really critical. Um, and again, it's not through any fault of uh, the individual schools, um, but they, are, they have to make pragmatic decisions around timetabling, around uh, the resources that are available to them, uh, these are not educational decisions. And uh, the, that variation in practice across the country that Jim described uh, are indicative, I think, of underlying tensions, unresolved tensions in governance. We're still caught between the, the tension between very centralised forms of accountability on the one hand, uh, 
and yet at the same time a presumption and a rhetoric of devolved responsibility and subsidiarity in relation to other elements of education. And there isn't really a coherent rationale for identifying which elements of governance sit centrally and which are devolved either to local authorities or to individual schools. And finally, and I think Jim's hinted at this, that the version of Curriculum for Excellence that we've ended up with operationally is not the one that was originally intended. Uh, some of the key principles and objectives that were set out at the outset and that were, you know, if you like, part of that genealogy from the national debate and uh, uh, the uh, ECS report, things relating to curriculum coherence from 3 to 18, these were stated aims uh, very explicitly more choice to meet the needs of individual pupils and ensuring that assessment and certification support learning. So these were high level of ob objectives at the very outset of the process. But I think maybe now is the time to revisit some of those objectives and to work you know, collectively, again, without blame, to, to identify ways to move forward from that. Okay. Thank you. Thank you very much, Dr. Britton. Can I now invite Dr. Shapira? <coughs> I wanted to talk about findings from the paper which we recently uh, have uh, finished. And this paper is about the uh, decline in the number of subject choices in S4. Uh, although we have done also other research around the narrowing of the curriculum, but I thought that probably would be most relevant. Uh, research to talk about here. And uh, we used the data provided to us by Scottish government, uh, the data from the Scottish Qualification Authority about subject entries and um, at schools uh, during the period 2011-2017. And then uh, we had this data on the level of schools meaning for every secondary school in Scotland. And then we analyzed the variation in the number of subjects offered to children in S4 and also in the number of subject choices made by children across different local authorities and across areas with different level of deprivation. And our findings were quite striking because we found a clear relationship in the rate of reduction of the number of subject choices made by S4 pupils and the level of school area deprivation. And this finding is very worrying. So in general, we have this trend of narrowing the curriculum. And on average, there is a reduction in number of subject choices across the entire secondary sec sector in Scotland. However, the reduction is larger in schools in higher area of deprivation, and the reduction is larger in schools where there are more children on free school meals, which means more children from deprived socioeconomic background. In schools where less subjects overall are offered for national level four and level five qualifications in schools where there are less qualified subject teachers. And these findings show that these particular developments in the curriculum of excellence, they put at disadvantage a particular group of young people. And this is the most worrying group. This is the group for whom the opportunities of social mobility provided through education system are very important. So uh, why it happened? And I think here we need to look at previous research that links between the curriculum and subject choice, attainment and progressions from school into work and higher education. And if we look at this literature, 
then uh, it, you, you can very often hear that curriculum for excellence had a number of unexpected consequences and the reduction of the curriculum is being considered as one of these unexpected consequences because at the beginning the uh, stated aim of the curriculum was to broaden the educational opportunities of young people. But looking at the existing literature, we will find that this reduction wasn't unexpected. That wasn't an unexpected consequence. And this is because there is a clearly established link, not just between student aptitude and their family background, family characteristics, and the subject choice that they made at school. There is also established link between school characteristics and uh, opportunities that school offer children in terms of subject choices they make. And when curriculum to excellence delegated more autonomy to local authorities and also to schools in shaping the curriculum provision and in deciding how many subjects and configuration of subjects that they offer to young people. This link between the characteristics of students in school and between the overall composition of the school intake in terms of a socioeconomic background of it and also in terms of ability composition, the link between that and the opportunities offered to children through the curriculum and the curriculum choices they make became stronger. And this is why today we can see this increased relationship between social deprivation on one hand and the curriculum choices on the other hand. And if we look at our findings, show, if we look at the trends, we could see really in 2011, the curriculum choices were far less differentiated by the school characteristics and by the local area level of deprivation than they are now in 2017. And for this reason, we just think that what should be done, the curriculum policies should be bring back to the more general understanding about the curriculum development and about the link between curriculum type and opportunities, reduction of social inequality, opportunities for social mobility. So this is one uh, uh, thing that we th think would be very important. But another thing, it's very important to carry out more research on the level of schools and to understand exactly the processes of curriculum making at schools at different levels, starting from the head teacher, but also their curriculum leaders and their teachers. And all they participate in some way in making these decisions and understanding to what extent they are prepared to participate in this process or feel themselves a part of this process. And whether they realize that by this process they shape opportunities of young people of transition, for example, from S4 into the upper stage of secondary education and then more importantly their transition from secondary education into labor market or in higher education, that, that would be very important and that only could be done if we carry out more research on the level of schools. And just one remark about the attainment. I think that it is very important to look at the changing levels of attainment in conjunction with changing enrollment in different subjects. Because uh, subject enrollment is a selective process. And then if we look at the attainment of those who were enrolled in in the subject, we can see rise in the attainment. However, if we don't account for this selection bias and 
just make a conclusion that attainment is rising, looking just at those who attain as a proportion of those who were enrolled in a particular qualification, we may miss again this important point that enrollment is going down and for some young people this is a missing opportunity. And this is not a random selection. Those young people who are missing the opportunity of being enrolled in particular subjects, these are young people more likely from more disadvantaged background. And this is where the attention should be. Thank you very much, Dr. Shapira. Um, uh, is uh, Dr. Brown, are you going to make an yeah, statement? For just, just some very brief um, comments. Uh, fundamentally, to sort of just um, explain our role in the, in, in the uh, panel today. Uh, as you know, we are uh, required to develop, validate, quality assure and award all of the qualifications that we're talking about today. Um, and we certificate those every August. Um, and the, the nature of what subjects are taken, as we've heard, is very much at the level of the school's decision in terms of, of those. But it's our responsibility to make sure that qualifications are available for people to, to enter for. Uh, I think on the point that um, Dr. Shapira has just made, we only have uh, data on the number of um, people who have attained our qualifications based on the entries. We do not have it on the school roll. I think that's an important point to make. Um, we did see a change in the volume of entries this year, uh, with small reductions continuing in SCQF levels 5 and 6, a very slight increase at SCQF levels 2, 3, 4 and 7, um, and we saw a small increase in the attainment about the wider area of qualifications that we make available uh, in terms of wider achievement and in, also in terms of vocational qualifications um, from SCQF levels 2 to 6. Um, attainment across national courses uh, and awards this year was broadly in line with what we've seen in previous years as um, we saw a slight increase in advanced higher and a decrease in attainment at National 5. Uh, we also published data uh, in August for a longer period of time uh, at a high level and that was published for 2011 to 2018 this year. And as we've um, heard from other panel members, the new qualifications were introduced in 2014. So the data prior to 2014 also included standard grade qualifications. And I'd just like to um, put some caveats around the comparisons that are possible between pre-2014 and post-2014. And there are some that are able to be, to be used. So before the introduction of the new nationals, um, candidates would be generally um, entered for two levels of standard grade, credit in general, foundation in general. But the grades that they will be awarded will be dependent on how they've done in those qualifications. So it's very difficult to actually look at entries at SCQF levels in the standard grade era. You can, however, compare attainment in SCQF levels prior uh, when standard grade existed with the current um, qualifications that are in place. So for instance, a learner who pre performed poorly in both general and credit assessments could have been awarded a foundation qualification. So it makes the entries a little bit of a mess, but in terms of attainment, you definitely can compare that. You can compare uh, entries if you add three, four, and five together in both systems. Sorry, that sounds a little complicated, but I think it's important. It's an important point. Um, so I think it, it is also important to, to say you can, we can look at attainment volumes, and I think that's the number of learners that are gaining qualifications at SCQF levels across the piece. That, I think, is a very meaningful uh, measure. And we have seen a decline in that over the, over the years, all the way back um, pr prior to the introduction of Curriculum for Excellence. And it does vary by subject, as uh, some other pan panel members have pointed out. So we, we have... Uh, undertaken some work to look at the attainment levels in English, math, sciences, languages, for instance, and that's included in our paper. But we're very happy to take any questions on the data that we've provided. Thank you, Thank you very much, Dr. Brown. Um, I'm going to uh, invite our vice convener to open the question. If members could indicate if they want to come in to me. Okay. Um, can I thank you all very much for that. I think there's, um, that's really important, I would think, first step 
and trying to understand what's happening. I don't think in this session we're going to really get to the, the heart of what needs to be done, but I think that that has um, actually been very challenging in terms of the idea that unintended consequence of a decision is that young people have got fewer chances in poor areas than they had five years ago, I find deeply troubling. Um, I wonder if I can focus on this issue of S4, and I do hear what Janet Brown says about standard grades, but that seems to me to be an argument to have retained it, not as something that confuses the, the statistics. Um, I wonder if, if folk have a, a, um, a clear understanding of why and who decided that we should not have um, certification at fourth year that allow young people from poorer backgrounds a better opportunity. Um, I wonder if you have uh, specific suggestions of what we should be doing about that, um, because f nobody was ever able to explain to this committee why that decision was taken, and therefore presumably it's a decision that could be unpicked. And this was the last question specifically um, to Dr Shapira. You seem to be suggesting it's not just that youngsters who are less able are having less opportunity, but that bright children in poorer communities are now disadvantaged more than they were before. And I, would, I think it would be worthwhile maybe expanding on that point. But if I can maybe ask, first of all, Jim Scott, and then yourself, or specifically on what we can be doing around this, for what should we be looking at, rather than some, you know, it may be an unintended consequence, but it's a very severe one. Um, I, I think your perception of, of what's happening and, and what we've, we've all tried to say is, is largely correct. Um, th there is a problem for the most able, and neither Janet nor I touched on the, the conversion rate from an enrolment to a success. And clearly something has happened at level five because that's gone down quite sharply. Um, part of that, I think, is that both parental aspiration and school aspiration has got a little bit ahead of what children are actually, where, the, where their inherent level is. We saw a significant spike in level five presentations in 2014, the first year. And I think that may have been based on optimism rather than realism. That has settled down since then. But we've both found this idea that where a child is an able child in a school in a less able catchment, they do not appear to do quite as well. But both our sets of data to some extent support that. You asked where this happened. The, the, the actual decision to move away from standard grade and finally settle on new national qualifications was made um, by the, the first um, education, sec or education minister, as it was then, of, of the current administration. My understanding is that she did that on professional advice. It was, this is my own obsession because when I was teaching, standard grade was introduced and the, wonder, the joy of having a certificated class rather than a non-certificate class, because it brought um, respect to the course and brought resource to the course. Um, the decision at National Four, not so much that, you know, maybe all people will aspire to National Five, but National Four is not externally assessed and it's a pass or fail. Do you think that had an impact and will continue to have an impact in terms of what, whatever you thought about standard grade, there was a great achievement for a lot of kids. You got them to general, or you got them out of found, or you got them to stay in school long enough to get a qualification. That sense of that bit disappearing kind of means there's a whole group there who just, they're not even going to be encouraged to achieve their potential. Yeah, one does want to encourage achievement. One of the things that's in my set of stats and Janet's set of stats is the fact that if you look at the lever data from 0910, the number of children leaving with no qualification is slowly creeping up. It's still very small, but the fact that it's creeping up in the 21st century in Scotland is not something any of us would subscribe to. Part of that is because some schools have been boldly experimental. There's always a danger for the head teacher in that head teachers should, with their school communities, be able to experiment and should try to offer a different range of experiences for their children. But my acid test as a head teacher was always, what will happen to that young man or woman 10 years down the line when they're applying for their third job? Have we equipped them well, not just to go out of the door into a positive destination, but to stay in a positive destination? Have we got them the appropriate broad and deep set of experiences that will support them? And I think there has been some experimentation. Um, it happened before CFE and since CFE with things like ASDAN and bringing Duke of Edinburgh into the curriculum. And I know in Perth High School, um, we did all of that pre-CFE 
And I know that my successor still does all of that post-CFE, so there doesn't seem to be a difference with the alternative experiences in many places. What seems to be the case is that the cutting down of the number of subjects, um, I have not carefully added up the numbers for level three, so I'll let SQA contradict me if I'm in any way wrong. But since we've moved away from standard grade, it appears that children on a narrower curriculum at a lower level are more prone to failure, and thus some of them clearly are dropping right through the system and gaining nothing. What I really need to do, or someone else needs to do in terms of research, is to track the children at the bottom end who are gaining five qualifications about level, four qualifications, three qualifications, two and one, and that is in the lever data, but it would have to be differentiated for the least stable. Um, that would allow us to see whether or not there is a significant change at the bottom. Obviously, the global measures, such as the number of children enrolling at level three, the number of children attaining at level three, indicate there has been a drop off there. I looked very carefully to see whether there was clear evidence that all of these children who disappeared from the level three stats had moved into level four, and thus there was a significant gain due to CFE. Sadly, the stats show that there may be some upward movement, both from level three to level four and from level four to level five, but there are significant numbers of other children who have just disappeared from attainment, and that's not necessarily because of the curricular narrowing. The 33.8% drop is 17% structural drop due to curriculum narrowing, and the rest of it is partially due to a drop in the role, and then it's partially due to how a school has structured its curriculum and the aspirations of the head teachers, teachers, and parents in that school. And therefore, there are several questions to be investigated there about what is exactly happening in certain schools in Scotland. But the, there is no doubt that the safety belt removal has added to the problem for these children. <clears throat> Our study is on the level of schools, not on the level of pupils. So what we see at the moment is that there is a link between schools, area level of deprivation, number of children in school on free meals, and the average number of subject choices at school. The mechanism of it, at the moment, we haven't done a study into it, so we can just have some speculations about that. But also, there is an existing literature that probably can offer some insights in the relationship and explain why school characteristics are important for subject choice. And what I, can, what I gathered from the literature, the mechanism of this relationship is not entirely clear again. More research is needed to be done. But the way it works is School, for example, school in more deprived areas, they might have more difficulties in attracting subject teachers, especially in such subjects as sciences, for example. And this is one way how this mechanism could work. Our study shows a clear relationship between the number of qualified full-time teachers at school and the number, average number of subject choices. Another possibility how this mechanism works is of course that having at school a larger number of children from more disadvantaged background may create a, some behavior atmosphere at school that affects also other students and affect their attainment and as a result affect the way they make subject choices. Uh, what we think and suspect going on here is also if we have more children from disadvantaged family background, the role is of schools in, in guidance, in career guidance, in subject choice guidance is becoming more important for these children because overall we know how important is the family and family networks and family advice on subject choice. Families could help youngsters to make informed choices because they can advise them 
about the consequences of their choices. If children are coming from more disadvantaged background, more responsibility goes to school for this guidance. But if schools uniformly offer less subjects, this automatically is cutting out opportunities for children from disadvantaged background of selecting more subjects or selecting facilitating subjects that would help them to, to make successful progression after school. So, and this is why we think that more research is really needed on the school level about curriculum decisions by teachers, but also by pupils and their families to understand the interaction between these and to understand how this is changing with the new curriculum for excellence. In a more deprived area, a child who's very well supported by their family and is very able is not going to be able to compete um, to get into university because perhaps they've already been denied the opportunity to the number of subjects they School wanted. School uniformly off offers five or six subjects. There is no way child would be... It's looking at the cohort of young people who are able to compete to get to university or college. I mean, logically, also with a cap, it does mean that people are competing on the, on the grounds of qualification. That's how the rationing is happening. Part of our ongoing study, because what we are trying to see is just the impact of the curriculum on excellence on subject choices and then an attainment and transition into higher education. There is a research in Scotland that has been done on the impact of subject choices on the transition into higher education under the old curriculum. What we are trying to do now to look at the impact of new curriculum of excellence and reduce the number of subject choice on the transition into higher education. Okay, um, I'm going to move on if, if people could maybe, we've asked um, members to direct questions directly to panel members, but um, if you want to pick up any points at an opportunity later on, I'd be happy to do that. But um, we've got a lot of people wanting in and I know everybody's tight for time this morning. So um, if I could ask uh, Ms Fee to come in. Conveners, I'll uh, roll my questions into one to try and get them uh, through them as, as, as quickly as possible. I, I can uh, come, I suppose, from quite a, a simplistic view that our schools should meet the needs of our children. Um, and certainly, um, Professor Scott, from what you said uh, in your contribution at, at the outset about the significant fragmentation of the, the, the curriculum and the almost chaotic explosion, um, it would seem that in some cases it, it's not. So I suppose my, my questions are around three um, areas, and it is around the needs of our young people and the flexibility that our young people now have in schools. Not, not all children stay in the same school from the gun at um, S1 until the, the leave to go on to college or university. So I'd, I'd be interested in the um, impact the number of curriculum um, areas have on a young person's ability to move and reselect and choose or follow a particular path. But I'd be also keen um, on your views on the impact that this has, has on our teaching staff. Um, and are the curriculums that are available in, in certain schools, are they because that's what the school can offer or because that's what the school thinks that their young people need? And my final question is around the skills gap. What impact does the um, curriculum choices that are available, what impact does that have in the skills gap? Because we hear quite a lot about particular areas where there are shortages of um, young people available to go in to a, a particular um, employment. Um, so does the, the kind of fragmentation of the curriculum impact on that? The, the obvious answer uh, to the last one, first of all, is, is yes, it, it must. Um, I, I'm not sure I would describe what's happening in S1 to 3 as chaos. Uh, I think it's a, a more measured attempt by individual schools to try and meet the needs of their constituencies. The, the question is whether they've got it right. They're obviously, the ones at the extreme ends of the spectrum probably have not got it right. What worries me a little is that my current trawl round them all again, a year after the one that's reported in this evidence, suggests that some of them are going further towards the ends of the spectrum, and that is an issue. 
You asked about staffing. Um, empirically, because it wasn't a major question in my, in my recent mini-survey of my witnesses, but I did actually ask them about staffing, and I, I run another research team in the University of Dundee, which is looking into SAC and PEF, and we have actually asked a whole set of head teachers quite specifically about staffing. And there is no doubt that some schools are experiencing difficulties in recruiting teachers in some areas. And some of those areas are quite key to the curricular experiences of a number of young people. It's not simply STEM subjects. We're, we're all making a great fuss about STEM at the moment, but the curriculum is much more than STEM. So there are significant deficits in a number of subjects, um, shortages of home economists, shortages of computing teachers, for example. Although shortages of computing teachers have been resolved by the fact that computing has developed by the best part of 50% in terms of uptake in S4. The question is whether that's a chicken or egg situation. And it's difficult to say. My suspicion is it's much more caused by the curriculum than by the lack of teachers in the case of computing. Um, does, does fragmentation affect the life chances and, and future pathways of young people? Yes, it does. I think that it's more affected by the narrowing in S4 because what tends to happen is if you're brought down to six or God help us five, let, let us assume there were no fives for the future well-being of Scottish children. If you're brought down to six, you inevitably have to have a bet with yourself about column six and what it is that's going to be beneficial to you. And that means if by any chance, but the, the real problem is not for able kids who pass all their subjects and move on because they've made the right choice and they can progress. Able children almost always survive in the system, although I completely agree with Marina's point about if you live in a deprived area, it is harder for you. But able children who succeed go through. Average and able children, and particularly less able children, who pick up a clutch of six subjects and fail several of them are then playing catch-up in a way that they probably were not playing in the, the situation before CFE, and that, that bears on the, the original question as well. So these children are in a situation where they had to narrow their curriculum anyway. Some of the key parts of their curriculum haven't worked out. So they're into repeats and they're into catch up. And what should happen, if you go down from eight subjects to six subjects, you obviously have 25% of the time available to you that you didn't have before, which would be redeployed in the pursuit of the six subjects you're still studying. That should mean a, that the pass rate is higher, the conversion rate from enrolment to pass is higher, and it's not. That should mean that the overall number of passes in these, that the passes in these subjects should be of a higher quality. There is some evidence that the passes are of a higher quality. That varies from subject to subject, but there is some clear evidence there that that is improving. And there is some clear evidence that the number of children getting at least one at the level is going up a bit, albeit more slowly, as I said earlier. So there are, there are slightly contradictory flows there. But the bottom line, I think, is if you don't get it right on the first hurdle. I remember the National Debate in Education, um, a highly commendable process in which one of the things that people said was get rid of the two-term dashes. We had two two-term dashes. Well, folks, we now have three two-term dashes. And children are indeed dashing. There is a big question that, that was mentioned earlier about level three and level four and the worth of those. The worth to schools, the worth to individual children, the worth to families and the worth to employers. I suspect that these qualifications would be seen a little more positively by all of these constituencies if there was something that did not simply rely on teacher judgment. Um, I, I remember the, the Deputy First Minister's recent comments on teacher judgment in CFE levels. And I agree with him entirely that there are issues there about the, the quality of teacher judgment across the piece. I don't think it's any different at level three and level four. Teachers do the very best they can. They try very hard, but they're not perfect people. Having an external agency that applies a rigid standard to that assists things significantly. Come on. Other questions from those three? Yep. Um, I'm going to move on uh, and ask uh, Ms Smith. Thank you, convener, and congratulations, may I say, on your new, new role. Um, could I ask Dr Brown, um, in the submissions that we have from uh, Professor Scott and from Dr Britton, uh, they've both uh, made the comment that in the uh, developmental period of curriculum for excellence, the three to five, 15 period was um, pretty good. 
there was a lot of um, organisation that was quite effective. But beyond that, um, it was largely left to yourselves to uh, do the senior phase. And as you rightly pointed out earlier in your opening remarks, that's not technically your job. Your job is to make sure that the qualifications suit whatever the educational strategy is. Do you think that that problem for the senior phase um, in terms of not thinking about the strategy in a coherent manner, do you think that's part of the problem that we're discussing? Um, I, think, I think part of the problem is the fact that was highlighted earlier by Jim. It was a 3 to 18 curriculum, and I think we need to think about it being a 3 to 18 curriculum. And I think the, the, the extension of broad general education by one year uh, had an implication on what senior phase was intended to be. Um, and the qualifications have to be the way they are in terms of the amount of learning that's necessary. And there, there therefore is a required assumption that candidates are at a particular level at the end of broad general education. So I think there is, there is clarity needed on, on the whole 3 to 18 pathway in order to be successful once you get to the courses that are co-designed by us and by teachers and by um, universities in terms of what, what we believe um, needs to be in those courses in, in that curriculum in the, in the senior phase for the candidates to go to the right destinations and to be successful in those destinations. But for me, it's very much around thinking about that pathway through. Uh, and I think we might have um, been a little disjointed between broad general education and, and what's required at the end of that in order to be successful in the senior phase. Uh, and can I just ask, do you feel that that um, lack of connection is more to do with what is on offer in, um, did I say the non-traditional, so the, the, the extra vocational um, courses, which in large cases have been pretty successful? Do you feel that it's to do uh, with what is on offer, or do you think there are qualitative issues here about the, the, the standards in schools in terms of what's being delivered in order to allow pupils to have that additional choice? That's a very complicated question. I, I, think, I think for me, the, the what is on offer, uh, if, if you're, um, Jim pointed out the, the idea that if you're going from eight subjects to six subjects, you should have more time. But eight subjects used to be taken over two years. Now we're trying to take six subjects over one year. And that has an implication. So. Um, that, that's a, compl a complexity that I think has an implication on uh, lots of different issues within the school sector. Um, so I think, I think it, what's on offer has an implication also in terms of how many candidates are being asked, do you want to do a higher over two years versus the two two-term dashes? Um, and I think that, that was one of the, the, the original implications was that would that would therefore free up some of the curriculum time in, in S4. My final point, if, if that's all right, um, we've had this discussion uh, before at committee about um, the National Four. And I think you're in the middle of a, a, a review of the National Four just now. Could you just tell us what time scale um, is for that review to be finished? Um, the, the review has been done taken by the Curriculum Assessment Board and uh, they are due to meet, I think, in a couple of weeks. We have a Scottish Education Council meeting tomorrow. So that's part of that group's responsibility to decide what the nature of National Four will need to be in the future. And that recommendation uh, will be made to Scottish Government. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, Professor Scott, you wanted thank you. to come in. Just please. three associated points, if I can remember them all. Um, I was part of the process that, that SQA carried through with respect to the 16 to 18 curriculum. As Janet knows, I was part of the curriculum area review group in language. I have to say it was a very thorough process that tried to involve all agencies and all parties in the process. So although uh, I am the author of the comments that, that Liz is talking about, there is no doubt that to some extent it was left to SQA and should not have been. The, the key question is where was LTS and what did it do? Mm -hmm. Um, nevertheless, the process was carried through by an attempt to bring together all the relevant constituencies. So the, the issue does not lie with SQA, I don't think. Um, there is a problem in schools associated with that. If you read school handbooks, if you have no life and, and nothing else to do, it, it's edifying to read the handbooks of 359 secondary schools where those exist, he said carefully. Um, 
because some schools, a minority of schools, but a significant minority of schools, appear to have confused the curricular levels with the assessment levels. And in print, one or two of them have drawn the conclusion that because their children have reached a given curriculum level, they don't need to be presented for attainment at level three. And that, that bears upon a couple of earlier comments as well. Um, so there is a situation where some schools in their presentation policy in their handbook say quite clearly that they will not present for level three. So one finds excellent practice in that some schools consider everything from SCQF level one to SCQF level six, and that's entirely appropriate for fourth year children because some are at the end of that spectrum. And other schools tend to look at levels four and five only. It would be accurate to say that the majority of the schools in the latter pattern come from what might best be described as leafy suburb areas, but those schools still have groups of children who are operating at level three or below. And to simply say we don't do that does not appear to serve the needs of all children. So th there are things running at several levels. The, the third thing I, I was going to add, if you'll forgive me, is that local authorities have a key role here. And there have been some very interesting practices by local authorities. Uh, no names, no pack drill. This is not the, the occasion for that. But some local authorities have given very clear guidance to schools about what they should do to try and deal with the S4 problem. Uh, I will quote one positive example, Glasgow City Council. Maureen McKenna's handbook for head teachers on curriculum for excellence is exemplary. It makes very clear that they should seriously countenance what happens in S3, that the experiences and the work carried out in S3 can count towards the 160 hours, and that takes away some of the sting of the doing it in one year instead of two. And um, I note with interest, however, that that local authority then allows its head teachers to choose. So some of them have gone for six, some have gone for seven, and we're all over the place to some extent again. But nevertheless, that's a local authority fulfilling its duty and giving a clear lead in saying S3 should count here. If all local authorities did that, trust me, they don't, then we might find ourselves in a stronger position. Thank you. Does anyone else want to come in on that subject? Oh, thank you. Um, I'm now going to move to... Um, I'd like to follow up on Liz Smith's line of questioning there. Um, Dr Shapira, a note in your evidence, you say that fewer subjects are being taken in school year S4 for level National 5 qualifications. And I was interested um, when you said that 2011 choices are far less differentiated than in 2017. I'd like to ask a practical question, and Professor Scott hit on it there. As a former teacher myself, um, I'm interested in timetabling and how this works in practice, and we've not spoken about that elephant in the room today. Um, Professor Scott there uh, alluded to the 160 hours for each NQ course. I'm really interested to find out a little bit more about how you think that would work in practice, because from my perspective as a teacher, one of the issues in terms of there being less courses taken is that you have less time in which to teach. So how does that work in practice? I don't think I can answer how it works in practice. Probably Professor Scott would know better than me. Okay, um, schools adopt various practices. Um, some of them change their timetable, not in June or August, but at Easter, and that buys them an extra eight, 10 weeks. It's not necessarily in some schools the most productive eight or 10 weeks, it would have to be said, because other curricular experiences are carried out at that point in time. But my experience of children is if you start them early, they will actually A, turn up uh, and B, engage in the process of learning because they perceive it's beneficial for the next stage of their education. So that certainly works to some extent. But the, the other thing is to deal sensibly with how you phase from S12 through S3 to S4. Um, when Eddie Broadway and I ran around Scotland on behalf of LTS for a couple of years, what we tried to sell schools was that they would operate a wedge system in S123, so that you would start with Douglas Osler's 14, 13 qualifications, and you would head towards what you were implementing in S4, which was six, seven, or eight. That went down very well at national meetings, but if you actually look at my evidence and what schools are doing, you'll perceive that a tiny minority of schools have actually taken that on, and they have gone in various directions. Um, there is no obvious pattern to what's happening in Scottish education in S3. It almost appears, it's not random, but it looks random when you first look at it. And that is a significant concern. How do you, how do, you do that in a wider sense? I suppose my question would be, 
why don't you do seven courses? Because HMI is evidence. Uh, apart from reading council websites and school handbooks, I, I also read inspection reports in schools. I cannot see evidence in HMI's findings over the past five years that schools doing seven courses are failing their children in a way that schools doing six courses are not. If you are familiar with building the Curriculum 3, sadly it's engraved in my heart just above Cali, um, if you are familiar with it, then realistically speaking, there is nothing in building the Curriculum 3, particularly pages 20 to 25, which refer to the curriculum, which in any way suggests that a school should do six courses. It says you should do what's appropriate for the needs of your children, which is quite right. So my question would be, in any school where there are children with aspirations, why would you not be offering them seven courses? In any school where there are children whose needs are profound, would you not be looking at a curricular system that allows a two-stage... If you go back to the Perth High School curriculum I left behind me, Liz might know better than me if it's still there, but realistically speaking, if you go back to that curriculum, we had a three-phase curriculum, an integrated S4 to S6, that allowed children to work in layers of ability and to pursue pathways that took six courses, seven courses, or eight courses. And that allowed them all the options that their ability permitted them to do. Now, one could accurately say that in a school the size of Perth High School, that's an easier thing to do, and that's absolutely true. But Perth High School is by no means the largest school in Scotland. So therefore, I've seen differentiated curricula, which is the answer to the question. Uh, I've seen differentiated curricula in a whole pile of medium-sized schools in Scotland, well done by head teachers and their colleagues who've worked out that you can do this. But you need to use third year. It's the only sensible way to do it. I suppose, I think from my experience, there was a reluctance in the profession um, when CFE came in, in terms of my own experience, um, the broad general education, the advice, I think, at the time, a lot of head teachers understood it to mean until the end of S3. And the fear in the profession at the time, as I was teaching at the time, I know, was that you could not assess prior to the end of S3. Um, the advice that was given by LTS Education Scotland, as it is now at the time, was that teachers were able to gather evidence for the outcome and assessment standards um, at the end of S3, but not to actually formally formally assess, as it were. Um, so I think there is perhaps a lack of confusion there for it. So at Perth Grammar, can I just ask Professor Scott, were you advocating course choice earlier in the year than at S3, for example, perhaps in February, or is that the model that you followed at that time? Um, I, I followed the model of starting as early to fourth year as I possibly could. I, I was never an Easter starter because I actually thought there were pragmatic reasons to allow the children to get through the exam process before changing. So I lost the two weeks before the exams that, that some schools have picked up. My colleague in Balfron at the time um, was very keen because she had a very, very strong school in terms of ability to get as much time into that as possible. She started at Easter. I know some other colleagues who started two weeks after me, and some, of course, actually started in August. So th there is a disparity of practice, but it's actually quite clear in building the curriculum three. I actually wrote this quote down in case someone asked me, and I'm grateful that you did. It actually says in BTC three, quite clearly, that learning in S3 can and should contribute to the 160 hours of directed study associated with the national qualification, and that children should experience these experiences that contribute to qualifications in S4 in that stage. So it, it's, it's actually written into the book at the time that people were not able to assess prior to S4. There was a reluctance certainly in the profession and the advice actually given at the time from Education Scotland was that no assessment was allowed to happen in S3. You were allowed to gather the evidence but you had to carry out the assessment in S4. So perhaps that evidence is some of the reluctance therefore to move to different models. I, I have a personal pathway through LTS which resulted in my in the end deciding that I was going to sever my connection with them and it's not germane to this meeting so I won't comment personally but Realistically speaking, I would accept that perhaps the, the <coughs> advice given was certainly contradictory, perhaps not from the agency itself, but from the individual officers who went out to service meetings. I certainly have evidence from, I, I ran for two and a half years as a, a local inspector for local authorities. I inspected 45 schools at that time. At the time, the senior inspector in HMI and I were reasonably close, and we cross-referenced the, the grades that we gave to make sure I wasn't making a fool of myself. So I'm fairly confident that what I say to you would be sustained by HMI. Um, what seemed to be the case was that schools 
did not understand what they were actually being asked to do and that some of that confusion came from national meetings which they had attended. I, I can never dig inside, nor can anyone else, what the mind of the individual head teacher or teacher actually takes from a meeting. That's a difficult process. But there seems to be some evidence that different people offer different advice at different meetings. To what extent that caused the problems, I cannot speculate. Thank you. Does anyone, did you want to come in, uh, Dr. Britton? Yeah. Thanks. Uh, uh, what we're hearing, I think, is illustrative of the, the very confused policy landscape where we hear advice, guidance, direction, uh, interchangeably uh, in policy making. Um, and it's very hard for schools, I think, to react to understanding what is statutory, what is in, you know, required of them, what remains advisory. Uh, and I think uh, that's the kind of landscape that has, has existed for a long time. It's never been resolved. But that seems to have fed the, the initial confusion, um, the uncertainty in uh, schools to know what it was that they were being asked to do or told to do. Uh, so that remains a tension of governance that hasn't been resolved. Yeah, very quickly. Thanks. Thank you, Camira. It's just with regard to changing enrolment levels, um, and Dr Shapira hit upon this as well. Um, I wonder if the panel has any views with regard to how many pupils you think should be uh, selecting a course for it to run, because I know from personal experience, I had three girls who wanted to take advanced higher modern studies in a previous life. I wasn't able to run that course because there wasn't enough footfall for it, as it were. Um, the girls were then sent to a hub school, which was providing advanced higher modern studies in the town at the time, and, and other pupils were able to do uh, likewise from other schools. Um, I just wonder, therefore, is there a, a view with regard to how many people should enable a course to run? Because surely in some instances, some courses can't run because there is an uptake. As far as I know, some schools where they don't have enough students signed to a particular qualification on a particular level, they offer these students to sit the same course somewhere else in another school or, for example, in uh, Edinburgh College. Uh, so there they are ways of solving this problem if this is the just question of how many students are assigned to a particular course and whether this is enough to run the course at school. At least a number of good schools with more advantages, school intake, they are clearly doing that in in Edinburgh, I know they're either sending their students to other schools that run those models or to colleges. Yeah, again, I think it's an example of the, the, the ad hoc nature of the, the landscape. There are pockets of excellent practice, really good models for just those scenarios. The Advanced Higher Hub at Glasgow Caledonian University, for example, which uh, started with modern studies uh, and has expanded to other subjects. but. There's no consistency. Uh, there, there's no national approach to this that would resolve some of these issues. Uh, yeah, Dr. Scott. There are choices Dr. to be made by any school, obviously. <clears throat> I, I, mean, I agree with my two colleagues in that there is good practice. The good practice is often in urban areas because it's very easy to move people around urban areas. There was an exemplary scheme in West Lothian, uh, which may still be running. I just lost touch with it which moved children throughout the area and had an entire transport infrastructure built under it to facilitate that. But obviously, if you're somewhere like Perth, where the, the high schools sit in pairs looking at each other across streets, it's, it's a very easy thing to achieve. I don't think we ever failed to deliver a senior school subject for a child in the, whatever it was, 14 years I was head teacher in Perth High School due to the lack of a teacher or due to the inability at the timetable. It might have been necessary to work with the academy or even with the grammar school on the other side of the town, but it was achievable. There's a wider issue about the extent to which there is a demand for certain subjects, because before you can service that demand, you need to have employed a teacher. So head teachers make historical analyses of what's likely to be wanted within their school, and they staff accordingly. Of course, you build up a pattern, and then it's quite difficult to change from that pattern, because what does one do with a surplus modern languages teacher, since many schools now have surplus modern language teachers? It's very difficult to persuade a local authority to take them out of your complement and park them somewhere else. It's, it's a disgusting way to describe a teacher's professional life, but that's what happens. So it is hard. 
Okay, uh, Mr. Scott. Thank you. Yeah, and, and all that will get worse, I guess, um, Professor Scott, because if it's if the, if it's narrowing. And as your figures show, um, French, German, Gaelic, and uh, computing geography are declining in terms of subjects, then local authorities are going to recruit le have less of those teachers. So the thing becomes a self-fulfilling prophecy, doesn't it? I I'm afraid that largely seems to be correct. It's, it's particularly evident in modern languages, as you've said. It's particularly evident in the creative and aesthetic subjects, where some of those are, again, falling very steeply. It's evident in some aspects of technology and yet other aspects are growing. So there is a certain counterbalance there. ICT, obviously, given that we live in the 21st century and we have invested tens of millions of pounds in ICT, the, the fact that it seems to be falling away is, is at best surprising. The other thing I was going to ask you um, uh, is on your number of, of um, overall attainment falling from over the five-year period by 33.8%, which has to be pretty deeply disturbing to all of us. What's the, what's, I mean, you, your your um, comments helpfully provided to the committee say that 16 to 17% may be attributed to this narrowing of the curricula. So what do we do about it? The logic of that is you, you change that. There is no obvious reason for a narrow curriculum. No. Um, so we got you, it wrong you, then. You we? might know better than me, with, with due respect, why S1 to S3 was introduced in the first ministerial response to uh, the curriculum review group's uh, paper. Uh, because uh, at that point in time, I think your party was part of the administration. So I cannot find out through research why S1 to S3 appeared. Mm. Uh, I've asked some of the key players, uh, a civil servant who chaired the committee, several members of the committee of the first one, why they did not mention S1 to S3 in the report, and yet it, it suddenly came up. The, the answer appears to be that someone decided somewhere, and no one can tell me. Either they're not prepared to admit to their guilt, um, if guilt is a particularly Scottish thing, or alternatively, they don't remember, which I find to be unlikely. So there is an issue about how we suddenly found ourselves bumped into S1 to S3. Bearing in mind that only five years before that report was published, Douglas Oswell had warned the whole of Scotland very carefully that S1 to S2 was being wasted, that secondary schools did not use it wisely, they needed to focus much more, condense much more, have a clear pathway forward, and then we added an extra year to that, causing a major problem of linkage with the S456 process. And no one seems to be accountable. Peter Peacock signed a piece of paper, uh, so maybe he knows something about it. But uh, I actually sent an intermediary to try and find out from him what the story was. And the answer that came back, allegedly, I, I can't quote it, did not in any way illuminate my darkness. So I'm a bit stuck about how we got in this mess. We should not be in this mess. And we're 14 years on, so what are we going to do now? Well, I think my evidence to OECD suggested that it was time for a midlife upgrade. OECD echoed that almost to the word. Um, there has not been a midlife upgrade since 2015, and I think it's past time for there to be one, to be honest. And, and who uh, leads a, mid a midlife upgrade? Well, um, Scottish education has not been well served in terms of using the, the benefits of research, I have to say. Um, only, only the Munn report actually accessed research to any significant extent. The rest of Scottish educational strategic initiatives are a bit research light, mm -hmm. if you want an honest response. I think Alan would probably yeah. agree with that. So we have a problem that it needs to be based on something that actually holds water. Who would be involved in that? My, my caution would be that you make that a broadly based process. I've sat, uh, I've sat in those rooms where national policy is decided. I've served in several national committees. People in those rooms do the very best they can. Um, I'm 33 and a third percent responsible for Circular 3 2001. We meant well, Ken Muir, Gordon McKenzie, and I, but we didn't get it right. And the idea that you stick three or four experts in a room is not necessarily the process. I, I actually thought that the National debate on education was a step in the right direction because we went to the wider public and we got quite a lot of the wider public and said, what do you actually value in Scottish education? We then brought that back and before two reports had gone by, it was completely changed. Uh, I have a, if you read the appendix to my paper to the OECD report in 2015, I actually chart that process. It's quite amazing how we got to where we got. So I, I, would, I would look for, uh, it, there has to be a political input, obviously. You are the people who make the decisions on behalf of, of the people of Scotland. There is no choice there. There have to be civil servants in the room. There have to be national agency people in the room. 
There should be teachers and head teachers and parents and children. The trouble is some of these bodies are severely challenged by being involved in making such significant decisions. And so what tends to happen is that you build a hierarchical structure with a national steering committee of the very great and very good and bits fall down to other people to actually implement. And it's the process of going up and down through those structures that loses the golden thread. And unless we can find a better way to do that, I'll give you one good example. Higher still is regarded by pretty much any academic or professional source who has commented upon it as being a successful initiative. It did something completely different. It trusted the initiative to Mary Perry and Tony Kiwi as two well thought of professionals with a chief inspector sitting alongside them to make sure we didn't do anything that wasn't acceptable to that constituency or to politicians. And the three of them ran it. There was an, an interesting degree of friction round about that as vested interests tried to operate with that. But they delivered something which was well resourced, was extremely well trained, was delivered on time, and which functioned quite effectively. Uh, if I look at the 51 strategic initiatives in Scottish education since 1947, only a third of them have been significantly successful, and most of those have been, I hate to say it because I have not been paid to say this, qualifications initiatives, whereas the curricular initiatives have generally had significant or partial trouble. So we haven't got the mix for curricular initiatives right. Does any of the panel wish to make further comment? No. Um, okay, I'm going to move on to Mr Mundell. Thank you, uh, convener. I wanted to return, if possible, just to a couple of comments uh, that have been made previously. Um, and I've got particular interest, given uh, my own constituency in, in the situation in, in smaller rural secondary schools, uh, where the number of subjects on offer has dropped and the number of teachers uh, offering those subjects even before qualification level uh, ha has dropped. And you get mixed messages from uh, those schools in my own region there's quite a big variation between what's on offer in Dumfries Town, for example, uh, and what's offer, on offer in smaller schools uh, round about. And, and, and some teachers uh, say that it's better to focus on a smaller group of subjects and, and, and do them better, teach them better. Uh, but uh, obviously, uh, parents are quite alarmed, um, or particularly around some specialisms like medicine uh, or, or veterinary study, where pupils aren't able to take uh, the full complement. Um, and I know that you've mentioned, uh, Dr uh, Scott, around capacity. I'm also worried at local authority level uh, that in smaller rural authorities uh, that there isn't uh, the same backup or support coming uh, from the centre. Um, and I know that, Dr Shapira, you mentioned uh, capacity. Um, uh, you mentioned, sorry, school characteristics, and I wondered whether any of your evidence uh, supported or highlighted some of the issues um, in smaller uh, rural schools. Uh, I don't know which one. Uh, on overall, we didn't really find in the multivariate analysis that the uh, region, in terms of rurality and the size of locality, have a significant impact on the number of subjects. But because we are looking at general trends, of course, but what we did see, we indeed saw that uh, there is a, although on average there are almost no changes in the number of subjects that school offer in S4, there are variations between local authorities and between different areas of deprivation. So probably what you are saying is being picked up by this variation between different local authorities in the supply side, in the number of subjects that school can offer, given the number of probably subject teachers they, they can recruit in these schools. Yeah, um, I, I, I agree with all that. Um, obviously, there are two forms of poverty that we, we attack and try to resolve in Scotland. And the one that gets the, the, by far the larger extent of publicity is urban poverty uh, because of, of the way in which things work in Scotland. Unfortunately, 
rural poverty and the other issues that attach to rural schools, the difficulties of finding staffing, which lies at the bottom of the narrowed curriculum, in, in, particularly in rural schools, I think, the, the staffing model of a local authority may or may not work well with respect to small rural secondary schools. Um, I've just finished reading most of the rural um, local authorities in Scotland for my latest troll because I, I do them separately from the urban ones because the issues are different. You're absolutely right to say that the curriculum in many rural authorities, particularly rural schools, can be quite narrowed. Uh, if I look at Highland with the, the plethora of secondary schools in Highland, there's obviously an issue in maintaining the breadth of curriculum that you might find in Inverness in some of the smaller schools that serve really quite small communities, albeit with a bigger hinterland. It's very difficult to achieve a solution to that. Um, once upon a time, Scottish local authorities offered inducements to teachers to go to remoter places, houses, extra money, golden handshakes, all of that. We live in the 21st century, and I don't think there will be many houses or golden handshakes at, at all. Um, that means that a teacher is then faced with the choice between going to somewhere that's five miles down the road and they can get a job and commute easily or moving themselves wholesale. The, the net result of that tends to be that teachers choose convenience and, and one can understand why, particularly women because many teachers are women with young families and all the issues that go with that. Um, I have to agree with you that the curriculum does appear to be narrower in rural schools. I'd like to say it wasn't true, but that does appear to be the case. Some of the, some of the subjects that we prided ourselves on on a hilltop in Perth are not evident in many of the rural schools. The core is clearly evident, and the evidence of attainment suggests that it's often very well taught by the teachers who are there. It's not that the teachers who are there are at any issue, it's just that the breadth cannot be supplied, alas. Thank you uh, for that. The second question I wanted to ask around was the, the unresolved tensions uh, you were talking about before. Uh, there's obviously a considerable mixed opinion sort of in the academic community, but also in the teaching community about whether or not the, the sort of core principles of the curriculum uh, have even been the correct ones. Do you think that that's just, do you think that, that contributes to, to some of these issues? There is, n there is nothing wrong with the core principles of the curriculum at all. Um, they, they, to a large extent, they devolve from prior principles that were uh, in evidence and in action in the curriculum before we got to the stage we are now. Uh, I, I personally have found no evidence that any head teacher or teacher I've spoken to disagrees with the core principles. Um, I think the issue is in how those principles are then enacted because a number of things were suggested in the national documentation. BTC3 is a very good document. It's a very thin document, but it is very effective. It does not exemplify what it preaches, but what it preaches is absolutely correct. And if, if you look at how it suggests you unpack that set of principles into a working curriculum, it covers not just subjects, but the skills issue, the wider set of experiences a young person should pursue, I think part of the problem, speaking to people from schools and local authorities, is that some of them have quite different understandings of the balance between these sets of experiences and the set of subjects that will actually embody the, the curricular subject part of that process. And, and really what you're coming back to is this idea that there is not a common consensus in Scotland about what CFE um, actually consists of. If you wanted to see it writ large, my, my successor as the chairman of Bosch, Jerry Lyons and I, if you put this in a room, we will shake hands warmly. We will talk about the families and all the rest, but 30 seconds after that, we will disagree profoundly about the curriculum. And we'll continue to do that through an entire morning. And that is an issue. And it's not about the principles that we disagree. Both of us would subscribe to the four capacities and the curriculum principles completely. We would disagree about the mechanisms. And that's because the documentation that was developed through the process of implementation does not deal with that. Um, if I give you the building our curriculum self-help group as a, as a metaphor for the whole thing, we were set up at the behest of Learning and Teaching Scotland. Our first report was produced as a Learning and Teaching Scotland report. We were then sent into the outer darkness because we said something that someone in LTS disagreed with. We became a multi-authority agency because we managed to persuade a majority of Scotland's directors of education to support us and to fund us. And we staggered on as a quasi-independent body 
due to the good agencies of that set of local authorities. Now, that says much for them. We then became quasi-official again, briefly, and our fourth report had a, a, a rubber stamp from a national agency that said, this is a good idea, read this. And our subsequent reports and activities have, again, been in formal multi-authority processes. As far as I'm aware, the Building Our Curriculum Self-Help Group has given the most exemplification. Why is there not national exemplification? There should have been. Mary Perry and Tony Keeley, who I mentioned earlier in terms of higher still, were criticised for providing shed loads of material. And they did provide too much. But I know why they provided too much, because they wanted to make sure the sorts of things we're talking about were never discussed. There is a happy balance between these two things. We have not struck that balance. Just to pick up on that uh, unresolved tension, uh, I, I think one of the, the more profound things that's been going on in, uh, in Scottish education is that you do have two quite distinct messages being sent out to, to the profession, to parents, to, to young people, about the nature of education and up until what is now the end of S3, the emphasis is on uh, forms of knowledge that are interdisciplinary, transdisciplinary, uh, and yet we still come back at the end of S3 to the discrete subject and the, the, the discipline. Um, and it's, if we look back on the process and uh, as a thought experiment, if you were to remove, uh, it's very much an extreme thought experiment, but rem remove certification and qualifications from uh, the landscape, what would the curriculum have actually looked like if the, if the same principles had been applied, the idea of a uh, focus on experiences and outcomes, you could conceivably create that vision for Scottish education from 3 to 18, where it's developmental, it's progressive, there's elements of personalisation and choice. But the challenge was always going to be that in reality you can't go through with that thought experiment. Uh, you have to have certification and qualifications. Uh, and so there is that rather abrupt shift in the fundamental philosophy underpinning Scottish education. That's the nature of the unresolved tension, I think. Uh, and I had one further sort of unrelated question. I've just come back, uh, Professor Scott, to the point you'd made uh, before about the number of pupils disappearing. And I know you're still working through uh, that, but do, do you have a sort of rough estimate of how many young people you think no, have I, dropped I, I, out of the I system? I had some help for, from SQA in pursuing that, and I'm grateful to them for that. Um, there needs to be more work here because we actually need to get to a level where we can interrogate the pupil data. Stirling University has done excellent work in starting to interrogate the pupil data. More of us need to do that. Um, I have deliberately chosen to come from the school side because I'm working towards a process where I show the extent to which schools and local authorities are actually engaging with their communities. And, and the answer, as you've seen in that little bit, is not as much as they should be. I think we're going to find that the percentage of children who were in level three has dropped from about 12% to about 3% of, of the original total. Some of them have gone upstairs to level four so the probable drop is something like a half to two thirds of them have disappeared into other places where they're not easily tracked. And the question is what they're doing. I've deliberately tracked very carefully those schools whose head teachers stand on platforms and say that they have now produced a more effective curriculum that better, needs the, that better meets the needs of their children. I cannot find significant differences in their curriculum before and after in any case so far. I remain to be pleasantly surprised that something new and exciting is coming. I also tracked other things that this committee knows something about. I tracked a number of schools that were doing 666 because my understanding was that you were told by the ADES representative at a previous meeting that there wasn't a problem about qualifications because schools were increasingly doing six courses in S4, six in S5, six in S6. The number of schools I can find who are actually doing that is a number easily said, it's nine. There are a number of other schools who hint that they might be doing that because some children will do five and some will do four and some will do six. And the, the implication, but not the statement, is that the least stable will do six because the other ones are doing five hires or three or four advanced hires. So it, it's possible to track some of that, but the ones who are hardest to track are the ones who are the least able to survive in the environment they find themselves in. And I think it's a matter of urgency. I'm actually a little bit ashamed. I've done my best to pull a lot of things together, but I'm actually a little bit ashamed that I've turned up without an answer to that question. Because I think equity is the most important thing we do. Yeah, sure, we have to pursue excellence. 
But equity is the thing that actually makes a difference. Thank you. Okay, uh, Ms. Bucket. Thank you, Convener. Um, yes, Professor Scott, you, you said in your opening uh, statement that it would take 10 to 15 years for a new initiative such as Curriculum for Excellence to sort of, sort of bed in. And I'm, I'm wondering a couple of things. Is there too much comparison with the old system in your research? And also, um, is, are your results, how much of your results are based on the sort of would you, um, based on the fragmentation of the implementation of the, of, of the system among schools and, and local authorities? I think it's a very unwise system that doesn't learn from the past. I'm not uh, suggesting it's, it shouldn't be a learning process. I'm just saying, is, is, that, is there a danger of you comparing it to the old system too much? Oh, you mean, um, am I some sort of prophet of the previous system? No, I, I say again, I spent three years running around Scotland trying to sell CFE to people. Mm. And I spent four years as the chairman of the Building Our Curriculum's Health Help Group, which has produced the only exemplification of it. No, my entire professional focus has been to make things better than move them on. So, no. I am, however, a historian, and therefore I draw upon the fact that, that a great deal has happened before and that we should have learned some of the lessons that have been learned before. The, the biggest problem we have in Scottish education with strategic initiatives is that, A, we don't get everybody lined up behind them, and, B, that to some extent, at least, we're not clear about what we're trying to do. And if I were to add a codicil to that, it would be when things go wrong, we usually have no exit plan. Uh, one, of, one, of the things, um, one of the things that people who aspire to leadership are taught these days is that you need to plan for failure as well as success. Um, I teach a whole lot of aspiring head teachers these days, and some of them are outstanding and will greatly improve the profession. But one of the things that we have to get them to look at is uh, most of them don't believe that of the 51 initiatives, 17 went well, 17 went badly, and 17 sort of stuttered along. You actually have to unpack that for them for about two lectures. After that, they go, I write. Head teachers tend to work in the now, and to some extent, with due respect, politicians tend to work in the now. And the reality of that is that you are looking to see what you need to do to move things forward right now. It takes a, a, a more reflective process to stand back and say, OK, where are we? What do we actually know here? What are we trying to achieve? And what do we know about how that might be affected? And the historical evidence is a key part of that. Equally, the research evidence is a key part of that. And apart from the MUN initiative, we haven't really used research to any great extent. Bizarrely, OECD, uh, who I wouldn't necessarily consider to be a research body, they're a transnational with a neoliberal stamp to them, but OECD are reasonably well respected. They gave us a very clear view of what we need to do next with CFE. The Scottish Government invited them in to give us that clear view. We haven't done much about that clear view. So therefore, there are things that we can do quite easily that are sitting there on the shelf for us. Mr. Scott talked about the idea that maybe we need to be a bit more inventive about how we build the group and the consensus that takes things forward. And I think that's absolutely right. There are some historical lessons that have worked. There is a clear and obvious thing that somehow SQA and its predecessor have mostly made their initiatives mostly work mostly quite well. Uh, you'll note the caveats, and, and Janet no doubt will as well. Um, there is something in what they do in terms of preparation and organization and, and actually focusing on how it goes forward that we might all learn from. Because what we tend to do is we set up a national committee, which is sometimes set up on top of the previous national committee. I was a member of the Curriculum Flexibility National Steering Group back in 2002. I made the keynote presentation at Hamden Park. I was taken into a side room at that meeting and told by an SQA colleague, who I shall not name, that something called Curriculum for Excellence was about to overtake everything we were doing and that everything we were doing was a complete waste of time. It was, it was a heartwarming moment for me. <laughs> and uh, realistically speaking, one has to say that we haven't always done the right thing. We can do it better. Can I just ask you one other thing, and it's about the head teacher guidance. You know, you'd said that um, you, know, you quoted the Glasgow model as, as being successful. Do you think it should be mandatory for head teachers to have curricular guidance? I think it should be mandatory for head teachers to tell the parents what their curriculum is and to have asked them what that curriculum might be in the first place. Um, my figures are quite clear that that is not the case at the moment. Um, I would personally have stuck with a national curricular framework. Uh, it was not the intent of the group that produced Circular 3 2001 to do away with the national curriculum framework. Someone else did that for us. 
So we ended up, as the responsible officers, having not recommended what actually happened. Uh, and that's another example of it doesn't always quite work out. So I, certainly in the secondary sector, it would be immensely helpful to head teachers and their colleagues to have some indication of what should be done. We're coming down to a situation where the five course people will disappear and the eight course people are fading fast, so they will probably disappear because other than in the leafy suburbs, eight is a fair stretch in the new system. You're gonna end up with six and seven. You're gonna end up 55, 45, 60, 40, something like that. Why do we have two systems? I ask again the question, what possible benefit is there from six courses instead of seven if the seven is implemented in the way that BTC3 says? So personally, uh, I, I once suggested to Dr. Allen in his previous incarnation that he should bring back curricular guidelines. Since he's not in the room to defend himself, I won't quote him. Um, it didn't happen is, is the obvious thing. Uh, and maybe one passing head teacher was never gonna make that happen. But realistically speaking, we could make an immense difference not all head teachers are curricular experts. Some are, some aren't. If you consider that one very unfortunate secondary school ended up four feet high in the national press for its unusual curricular structure, people were pilloried, parents were alarmed, children were alarmed. None of that would have happened had we had some guidelines. Okay, thank you. Okay, I'm gonna move on to Mr. Grave. Uh, one specific question following up the issues around guidance issue to teachers. Um, so, Professor Scott, you mentioned that uh, at the start of the transition into curriculum for excellence, there was this particular issue of um, head teachers receiving confused or conflicting guidance depending on which national officials they were speaking to. That there had been a bit of an improvement in recent years, but then you mentioned that uh, much more recent events have again sowed some confusion there. Could you expand on what those recent events are? I need to be careful not to tell tales out of court here. I was giving you a very broad summary of, of the feeling that is coming from the head teachers I'm interviewing at the moment. The, the problem is, is the removal of unit assessments. Um, a significant number of the head teachers, roughly 65% of those I've interviewed in the sample is about 30. Um, a significant number of head teachers are saying that their colleagues are coming back from meetings now somewhat uncertain about what they should actually be doing and how the changes affect them and their students. Now, I'm not in the school anymore, so it's dangerous ground for me to stand on here, and I'm not gonna stand there for any length of time. There, there is apparently an issue with respect to the latest change. But if I can take the wider point and thus escape out from under your question with, with some, hopefully, skin left on me, um, there is a problem about the extent to which we're piling initiatives on initiatives. And one of the problems that Scottish education has experienced, this is the second period in Scottish education since the war where we've had this tremendous pressure of initiative. It happened back in the 80s when there was a great surge of initiative and then it went quiet for a little while. And then from the build up to 2000 onwards, it's just gone up. And it's entirely understandable and, and perhaps more so in, in the context of a Scottish parliament rather than a UK one, that people who are in a position to pull the levers of power, want to pull them. Because you all want to make things better. We understand that. The problem is that unless you get it right, you can actually make it worse. And I'm not suggesting for a moment that any of you would wish to make it worse, but sometimes it doesn't work. My, I, I can show you evidence, it's actually here. I can show you evidence of those failed initiatives, abandoned initiatives, truncated initiatives, didn't work out the way it was supposed to be initiatives and the impact they've had on the lives of children, primarily children, teachers and parents. And we just need to do it a bit better. Thanks very much. I, I won't continue to press on that question because I appreciate how, how open you've been with the information you have. That's which I can't do. Yeah, <laughs> um, but another I'd like to turn to is um, the issue of the, the transition from S1 to S3 into S4 and we've touched on the somewhat, I suppose you could describe it as a misalignment or coming at it from slightly different philosophical basis given who was responsible for the development of, of each of those phases. But I was quite interested, SQA did a report, I think it was published this time last year, on the experience of learners and the feedback from learners being that they felt that that was quite a significant and, and unsettling shift. And 
we've discussed the, the tangible impacts around subject choice and, and achievement. But I'm interested in the, the less tangible impacts there of the, the effect it has on the learner's expectation of their own education journey, of their own aspirations. I don't know if, if the SQ went into any detail on that or if there's evidence available from elsewhere, but does anyone have any evidence of what the, the impact is on the learner's own expectations and, and their experience of education? Yep. Um, I, what, what we did was a survey of schools, uh, head teachers, uh, senior management teams, um, teachers themselves, but also very importantly pupils, as to how they felt the transition and, and their experiences of the new qualifications were. And we've done two of those um, reports, so they've been published over the last couple of years. And what the, what the young people were basically telling us is that the pace of learning that they experienced during broad, broad general education was quite slow. And not across the board, again, there's variety all, all, all the way across the, the, the system. And that as soon as they hit the qualifications, the pace of learning increased dramatically and they found it very challenging. Um, and there's multiple reasons why that happens. And I think we've touched on some of them in terms of, you know, the, 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 the amount of time that's available for particular subjects, for instance. Um, but what we felt was that um, we felt we needed to go back and ask them how they had experienced it the year after because we, the first year was very much S4 pupils so we talked again to S5 and S4 pupils and and again uh, the feedback from the from the kids was very much um, it's getting a little bit better because the pace of learning in BGE it as t it, we've introduced this very quickly I suppose is, is is the challenge there has been not a lot of piloting as was mentioned earlier and I think teachers were getting their heads around it so there was a bit of improvement in the second stage but the, the, the kids definitely said that the the pace of learning that they found when they hit S4 went up dramatically I wonder if, if anyone else is aware if, if there is any academic work out there on the impact on pupils sense of self-expectation on, on their aspirations as a result of the, the shift in that transition. Mark Priestley was working with Highland Regional Council at one point in time doing a linear study of children there. I, I don't know whether they still are, but I don't know. Because I, I thought that had great promise to actually watch what happened to children going through the process. Um, I'll drop Mark an email and see if there's any sort of, or maybe we'll get to him before me, and we can find out whether there's anything that's still going there. Not aware of anything else. Yeah, I think that, that'd be very useful. I'm sure the, the committee's been in touch with Mark already, I believe. So I think maybe two brief responses. It may also be that some of the best data about the impact on young people is actually held by Youth Parliament um, and, you know, the Commissioner. You know, there are, there are other people who are trying to, in Young Scott, who are trying to keep up with what's going on with the possible impact on young people's health and well-being around the, the nature of the examinations pressures as well. But the, more, the, the broader point that occurs to me is there is actually very limited research. Uh, that we, we, as a, for such a major initiative, it is massively under-researched. Could I just add one more thing? One of the things we've recently been doing in SQA is talking, using Young Scott to actually talk to young people about what do they feel about assessment? What should the future of assessment look like? And that's a very interesting approach and we'll be publishing a, a report, well they will be, Young Scott will be publishing a report on their views around assessment. And, and young people want the qualifications because it, that is seen as the passport to the next stage but they want the assessment to be much more um, fluid and much more continuous as opposed to the examination piece so i think it's really really important to keep talking to young people because there, there is a real challenge that we we talk a lot about how schools approach it and how teachers approach it but but young people are the people that we're working for and doing it for do you have a in, indicative publication deadline uh, it'll be october yeah, fantastic thank you Okay. Thank you. Um, I've got a very quick supplementary from Ms. Goldruth. Thank you, Commissioner. Just a brief supplementary to Ross Greer's point, which I thought was really interesting with regard to young people who we haven't almost spoken about until this point in the meeting today. And it is you the young people. And Professor Scott, I note in your research you talk about column choice. And I know in certain high schools, um, the pupils design the curriculum, as it were, because they opt to take choices and then the timetable is uh, arranged around about their needs, which seems much more responsive. Um, but I was really interested, Janet Brown, with regard to the SQA's findings around about uh, the mental health of pupils in the system, particularly with regard to assignments and the gathering of data at that pressure point at the end of term. So as you're approaching the exam diet around about March, April, you've got 
assignments due for every subject area potentially for higher and that five level and the impact that has on, on children in terms of their mental health. Has the SK considered, for example, staggering when those deadlines might be to not put pressure on the children just before, or on pupils rather, just before they go forward to sit final uh, examinations? Because I know it's a huge pressure point in schools for teachers, but really for pupils who are sitting subjects in a range of different areas. Yeah, well, that is the date that we pick it up. It can be done at any point in the year. Mm -hmm. That's part of the flexibility of an assignment is yeah. it, it can be done at the appropriate point for that particular learner. We do recognise that, you know, the, the, that a lot of people tend to do it right towards the end because they've gathered all the knowledge up at that point. Um, but it, it is a flexible environment. We need to pick it up at a certain point in order for us to be able to mark it. But that's part of the reason why we're engaging with young Scott, because it's actually to start looking at how can we assess those skills and those abilities in potentially different ways. And, and we need to be thinking about, it's not going to happen next year, but we need to be thinking about ways of doing it slightly differently. Yeah, I, I would say with due respect, teachers usually work to a deadline. So if you're given a deadline when it's going to be picked up by the SQA, that's when it's completed for. So I wonder if SQA therefore could think about considering having a different date in the year, which is perhaps earlier, so that there isn't that crush at the end before the final examination. Yeah. Yeah, so for Examination Diet 2019, we obviously have challenges every year, um, depending on where the Easter holidays fall. Um, so there is a, a, a deadline date, um, which is towards the end of March for next year. And a lot of subjects fall into that category, but where there are practical subjects or subjects where um, the coursework has a very high proportion um, of the final overall grade. Um, these dates are actually, they get pushed back. So we have other collection dates that go quite far into April, for example. So it, it wouldn't necessarily be the case that that was single date is the date that everyone has to work to. Yeah. Okay, I'm going to bring in Mr. McDonald now. Thanks very much, Kavina. Uh, before I go on to my questions um, on the narrowing of choice. I was wanting to ask a couple of technical questions about the data, just to try and understand it. Um, my understanding is that school roles have been dropping in S4. Um, they will pick up eventually, because we can see the pressure in the primary schools. Uh, yeah. yeah, but certainly in S4, we've seen from 2011, 55,000 uh, S4 pupils down to 49,000 in the last numbers that are available, 10% reduction. So have you reflected that in your comparison of um, exam results from year on year? And secondly, in terms of colleges, um, we, we've talked about the fact that some uh, pupils are attending colleges for courses. Have the number of passes at colleges been reflected in the data as well? But, uh, the answer to both your questions is yes, to, to save a lot of time, but I'll amplify a little bit. The, the, the drop in S4 is probably one of the second tier effects. Obviously, the drop in curricular structure causes the 17% drop. There, there is no doubt about that. That's evident from the structure. After that, you're left with a remaining 16.8%. And there's no doubt that roughly half of that comes, particularly as it goes forward, from the declining role. It's not quite as evident in the earlier years of CFE. It's become a greater fact. And you saw that this year in 2018 because it dropped quite sharply. And that's partially due to the declining role and partially due, I suspect, to something to do with unit assessments and, and, and the changes that SQ have made. But there are a number of factors in there that cause the problem. There, there is a very clear evidence that you may not spot quite as easily with respect to over-aspiration by someone in the early years of CFE to have children in level five, and particularly in 2013-14, was a huge lump of children who've ended up in level five who simply did not pass at all. That has tapered off a bit as we've gone on, and to some extent that's balanced the growth of the, the, the decline in the population. So I tend to factor those two against each other and hover a number of about 8% against the two of those together. You then are left after the 17%, which was 12% initially curricular decline through the 17. You then have a remaining at the moment 9-10% left over that's due to other factors. And I think I've managed to evince most of the, the reasons for those as I've gone through this morning. Aspiration is one. Particular twists to the curriculum structure, not, not just shrinking the number, but there are some strange little twists in when people in a few schools actually present Others certificate core subjects such as RME or PE 
And that means that you get a slight upward boost to some numbers because they're adding that to their six or seven or eight. So it's not a simple process, unfortunately. I wish I could say it was. And if you're asking the question, did I take account of all these factors, then thank God I can say to you, yes, I did. Thanks very much for that. Um, the, the one question I was wanting to ask in relation to um, narrowing of a choice, we had a quote back in November of 2016 from Dr Bill Maxwell, who was the previous Chief Executive of Education Scotland, and he said, one key difference which has emerged nationally is that young people are taking exams in fewer subjects at the end of S4. He goes on to say, as they move into S5 and S6, there is also the opportunity to study different or additional subjects from uh, those studied in S4. Uh, and it, f the quote finishes by saying, some higher attaining young people bypass exams in S4 and instead follow a two-year course to hires in S5. And the example is given of young people taking courses in S5 and S6 that would have been taken in S4 is that in 2017, there were 62,000 entries at National 5 in S5 and S6, which was 21% of the NAT5 total. So I know you said at the beginning um, that you were comparing um, fourth year uh, results because the data was easily available and easily comparable. But will the picture change as you then move on to fourth and fifth and then fourth, fifth and sixth as the data becomes available? Yeah, uh, that, that's absolutely correct. You, you're quite right to say that. I don't have any problems with that at all. The, the reality, however, is that the va <laughs> it's not often you get a chance to offer a trailer for a forthcoming academic paper, but here we go. Um, if you wait a few weeks, I'm actually going to demonstrate what the curriculum of every Scottish secondary school is and how that is concatenated through S4, S5 and S6, because I've done that. And the overwhelming situation in most Scottish secondary schools is that they still offer either 654 or some of them have been liberal enough to go 655. Uh, you've heard me say that 666 almost doesn't exist apart from the, the least stable children. Much of the uptake you're talking about comes from that least stable or lower middle group who are picking up an extra subject in S5 or S6, and that's allowing them to pick up one or two extra qualifications. That's the driver for the continued growth in more people getting one at that level as we go on. Uh, I say again that that growth has actually slowed since CFE, so there are, there are contrary tides working there. But what you're saying is absolutely correct in that more people in S5 and S6 are turning to lower level qualifications. SQA's data shows that, my data shows that, and that will be a beneficial factor. The problem is that, that does, what that tends to do is disguise the issues that are actually happening in the stages because they're all lumped together in one set of results. One of the very useful things for us would be to disaggregate those. Um, I've been trying very hard to pick out the five at three, five at four, five at five figures, the traditional ones, to which, interestingly, more schools are returning in their presentation of attainment. In the years ending 2014-2015, it was almost impossible to see a school's progress against five at three, five at four, five at five. They gave up. But we're increasingly returning to that. I'm carrying with me, if you wanted to see it, um, the results of 50 secondary schools from the 359 and that actually shows you the extent to which they're improving in fourth year because we can pick that out as fourth year figures. But we actually need to be able to do that to see what the effect of fourth year is and what the effect of the subsequent years are. You're absolutely correct. Okay, thanks very much. Okay, I'm going to take a quick supplementary and then I'll have final questions. Okay, thanks very much. Um, I suppose one of the things I'm struck by from your evidence, which I think we want to look at further, is there's quite strong lessons here about how new initiatives are developed, and the importance of evidence, the importance of monitoring or getting evidence at the point where you're developing a, um, a plan and in the implementation and, and how it's been implemented, and this thing about unintended consequences, which I think we would um, hope to go back to. So I'm wondering, I mean, I'm sure you're all aware of the controversy around standardised assessments, and I wonder, do you have a view on this initiative? How well do you think the initiative has, the evidence has been sought for it? And how do you think it sits with curriculum for the philosophy of curriculum for excellence? Can we have very brief question, answers on that? Because I, I, we're I pushing the boundaries Dr. of the, of the, the work. I was yeah, quite but, interested. Yeah. I think it has to be seen in the context of the broader initiative in education. So, um, if you could, Dr. Shabira, would you like to answer first? Oh. 
so uh I think just at the moment when we only can look at the emerging, we're only starting to seriously look, collect the data and look at the emerging trends and thinking about these trends. And what is important at the moment to try to develop more sort of, um, first of all, more informed understanding of what's going on at all levels and try to understand the interconnections between curriculum impacts, the developments on the school level and the consequences for enrollment at, at different levels and progressions from one level to another, but also think about the impact on the attainment and progression and what I also think it is very important to understand the consequences on the various outcomes of pupils, including the consequences on the outcomes, on their well-being, and on the broader competencies that they develop, on their skills, and that partially could be achieved looking at the data on early destinations, of school leavers, for example, but also if we can benefit from analyzing existing longitudinal data that can show us the pathways of young people who go through the secondary education system, not just now during the period of the implementation of the curriculum for excellence, but also those who went through the secondary system before them. So if we look at the data over the last 10 years and compare outcomes of those who were going through the system before 2013 and after 2013, in terms of their out broad outcomes, attainment and transitions and destinations, then combining this data with understanding on the level of policies and schools and local authorities what actually going on would help us to develop recommendations and to fulfill that mid-life policy, how it was <laughs> expressed, and introduce much needed ch changes in the way the curriculum for excellence being offered and implemented in the in the secondary schools at, at different stages. So I think it's also the answer to the question who should be on this committee who will review this mid midlife policy changes. And I think uh, for sure also educational researchers, also specialists in curriculum, also those who see the relationship between type of curriculum and consequences for social inequality. Thank you. Does anyone else want to see Dr. Britton here? Well, it's clearly a, it has become a highly politicised issue. Um, so I want to separate my take on it from any of that and apply the same forms of analysis as I've done to the origins of Curriculum for Excellence, which is to consider whether as a policy initiative does it pass certain criteria around the extent of consultation, the extent of reference to existing research from home or abroad, the extent of consensus building, um, and I'm not necessarily seeing those characteristics in relation to this policy. Dr Scott. Yeah, Professor maybe, Scott, maybe sorry. to entirely support what Alan just said. Um, obviously, one needs to be... Uh, uh, we're not political. We're here as researchers. We're not, we know what you're doing this afternoon. Um, we can only look at an initiative and judge it by the evidence that demonstrates it will be beneficial. At the present moment, I do not think I have personally seen, although I'm not claiming my reading is exhaustive, sufficient evidence to say it would be beneficial. I, if I were chairing our committee, I would only bring an initiative to that committee if I felt I could demonstrate that it was well thought out, that it would generate clear benefits, 
and that there was a mechanism for carrying that out effectively. I'm not sure we're there at the present moment, and it, it's typical of Scottish education. Very quickly, Mr um, Mundell, but and, and on the issue of today's, which is about the exam results and right. attainment. Well, thank you, Convener. It, it related to a point that came up elsewhere around piloting, and I just wondered whether, uh, whether uh, Professor Scott would agree that some of these issues have come about because, again, there hasn't been enough road testing uh, of initiatives before they've, they've been introduced and rolled out across the country. Yeah, there's, there's a terribly awkward balance in, in the development of an initiative because one wants that. Philip Banks, ex HMCI, used to rant, um, and the word is used advisedly, that it took 15 to 20 years to fully bed in any Scottish major initiative, and he was right. And there is that terrible tension between starting something and wanting to have it apply to young people to improve their situation and making sure that you've got it right. And all the things that I've talked about that haven't quite worked or haven't worked at all are on the basis that someone's rushed something and there hasn't been sufficient work done to make sure it's going to go forward. And that's unfortunate because we do keep doing that. Um, piloting in the case of CFE would have been extraordinary. I can't possibly talk about the current situation. I'm not going to. But in the case of CFE, it would have been very helpful if we'd actually tried to work through some of those Eddie Broadway and I produced curricular model after curricular model to try and help schools. We brought dozens of head teachers and deputies and principal teachers together to try and get them to work through what that would mean for their school. We did what we could as a totally independent agency. That would have been better organized on a central basis. There were a number of gatherings when people were brought together, but they were not brought together to look at evidence from that sort of piloting. You can't actually launch the curriculum for three years in one school ahead of the others if it also involves a major change of the qualification system. You have to work with what you can do. But we could have done that and actually, for a while there were two groups that were trying to do that. One of them only lasted about six months, sadly, and decided it couldn't do it. Uh, we carried it through as best we could. But we're, all of us who were involved in that process are aware that more could have been done and that we could have done a better job. Piloting is, is an important thing. OK, if I could move to uh, questions of my own now, if that's OK. Um, finally, and uh, almost back to, to where we started, to um, something uh, Dr Britton said about the principles of curriculum for excellence in the very start of this process. In the previous committee in 2012 took evidence um, on the curriculum at that stage, and Terry Lanigan, who was the Director of Education at Western Bartonshire, but representing the Association of De Directors, gave evidence at that time. And he said that the new system is not about going for eight to nine qualifications in one year. It's a continuum of learning. Um, he, he also went on to say that it was about, you know, that pupil specific need of an individual's journey through the process. Um, talked about the two term dash to hire, which was considered a problem at that time. But he said the other myth has grown up that the idea that those schools that choose to present some or all of their pupils for eight qualifications in S4 are somehow in somehow doing better than those that adopt another model. So it's really to the crux of this is about the models that have been adopted in this. this and the reason um, I'm also looking at um, the UCAS figures for Scottish um, enrolments this year, where it shut up by 4%. Of course, that doesn't include some of the articulated routes that some people might have to degree level qualifications through the colleges. And also in June this year, the National Office of Statistics published um, the attainment and leaver destinations for young people and showed that 92.9% .9 of the 2016 school leavers were in a positive destination. So while I absolutely accept the the correlation that's been made between the subject choices and some of the areas, and I accept that the curriculum has na narrowed at S4. I'm still struggling to see what evidence there is that this is affecting the outcomes for young people on leaving school. And um, there was also, um, it, it was said that the universities might not, you know, they somehow be disadvantaged if they didn't take the subjects in one year. And that's another thing that I think that has been, the universities are saying they're looking at the whole curriculum final stage for, for, for um, you know, um, deciding on, on what, what students to take in for degrees. So I'm just asking what, what, what evidence there is that this is having a, a significant impact on youngsters. Some of those in my presentation and, and in my paperwork, but I'll say them again. 
um, there is clear evidence that the problems of S4 have now transferred themselves to S5 and that the, the higher situation, the higher attainment has changed its profile. We had a, SQA can say it better than me, we had a steady growth in higher attainment from around 2006, 2007 to the current moment. That steady growth was predicated on two things. Um, a, a brief period of uh, growth in the pupil body and also a profession bedding in higher still. There was no major initiative during that period at all, thank goodness. Um, it was predicated on a profession coming to terms with what higher still meant and actually implementing that effectively in the schools and allowing teachers to become expert in, in producing that and affecting the learning of their children. So we had that growth and suddenly when we come to the first year of the new hire in CFE system, the growth profile changes completely and it looks with the, the latest figures that there may actually even be a downward turn in hire, never mind slowing the, the progress. So we see that quite clearly. Obviously advanced hire is not affected because the most able children in any system tend to reach the top anyway. So higher, the fourth year qualifications, clearly there are issues. We've seen that the one at five, one at six leavers figures, the profile of growth, which was significant up to 2013, has suddenly changed and is on a much lower level of climb or perhaps even has leveled off in one of the indicators. So we see there evidence as well that things appear to be changing at the top end. You do not get a sudden and irrevocable change when you change qualification systems. What tends to happen is a pattern establishes. The, the, the reason I've deliberately delayed a whole lot of this is HMI would say to you that anything less than three years does not constitute a trend and they would prefer five years. So we wait with our data until we can actually demonstrate that something is happening. There are now signs that something is happening. It sure as heck is happening in fourth year. It's happening to a lesser extent in fifth year and in leavers data, but there are signs that changes are occurring. The best time to do something about a, an unwelcome change is early on in the process. I don't think one generally waits 10 years to see if it's as bad as one thinks it is. So the, the time now is to do something and see if we can actually ascertain what's going on. Dr. Britton, would you like to come in on that one? No, I, I, I agree with, with Jim about the, the time scale for these things, but it, if we wait for longitudinal effects to really bed in, that will be too late. Okay, uh, I, I, sorry. Agree with my, I agree with my mm. colleagues, uh, but I just want to add, in addition, the question is why, how do we have evidence that this narrowed choice has a negative effect? Uh, overall, yeah, we will have to wait and see, look at the trends in probably a couple of more years, but more generally, if we think about if children at age as early as age 14, they already have to do some choices that would affect their future because subject choice at S4 affects subject choice at S5 and S6, consequently affects opportunities of transition to, to the university. So less subjects choice on S4 means that if they're not successful in these five or six subjects, then instead of doing hires, they will have to take other subjects on lower level and they will have less opportunity to take qualifications on higher level. But this is also about, we shouldn't narrow the opportunities of young people. We shouldn't restrict it just pragmatically to the subjects that they <clears throat> need to study in order, for example, to make a progression to the university. Why young people should decide not to selecting, for example, history or geography or the third science subject because they just don't allow to. Why we expect that at age 14 and 15 they know what they are going to do when they are 17 or 18? Why we are not giving them opportunities to remain open about this until probably age 18? But in order to do that, we need to keep their choices quite broad. We need to allow them to choose more, not less subjects, and try different things. So in this sense, I'm sure that narrowing the curriculum has a negative effect on basically on everyone. Okay, Dr. Brown, you wanted to? 
Um, yes, I, I mean, I think that it sort of exemplifies, this whole conversation exemplifies the fact that it, it's really important to not just look at the SQA um, qualifications, because they are year on year. It's about the senior phase, and it's about understanding what um, students achieve at the end of the senior phase, whether it's whether it is the five subjects, whether it's the eight subjects, and what impact does that have on their success in the future. But we don't have that data at this point in time, and I think that is a set of data that's really critical. And I would argue it's also critical to do it for three different groups of students. The ones that are, are, are find learning challenging, the ones that are the, your average student, and the ones that are the high achievers, because it will have a different impact on each group and I think it's really important that we understand what that is. Okay, thank you. Um, I just, yes, very briefly, Dr. Uh, Professor Scott, yeah. Um, some of our problem is caused by the management information system now used in schools, Insight. Um, it was a bold venture to try and incorporate equity into the reporting processes of Insight. I have to say, as someone who's, I, I was the first principal teacher of computing in Scotland. Um, I have worked with management information systems for a very long time. Um, whereas the previous system was quite effective and efficient and relatively easily used, Insight has been, according to almost every head teacher, deputy or director of person I've interviewed, something of a trial. It now incorporates level three, which is progress at least, but Insight will very easily spit out key data. But we were talking earlier on when Mr. MacDonald asked the question about the proportions of fourth year, fifth year and sixth year, and that's an absolutely key question. If we actually had the five at three, five at four, five at five data for fourth year, as well as the fifth year data and the sixth year data, we would have an instantly better picture of what's going on. And if we also had a local authority level breakdown and or a school level breakdown of what's happening, because schools are generally not publishing the results, we would have a much better picture of what's going on. It's, it's not difficult for a government to cause that to happen because that's what happened before. I understand in the process of transition, because things were so different, that there was a period where it had to be got up to speed and moved forward. And we all understand that. But we're now in a situation where that could be generated quite easily. If I go and tap a friendly head teacher on, on the shoulder, I asked a, a national room full of head teachers three weeks ago, last Saturday, how many of you know your five at three, five at four, five at five data? Every hand went up. How many of you published that? Two hands. And I asked the others why they didn't. And the, the standard answer was, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Um, there really was no clear answer given at all. You have the opportunity as the administration to change that, no, not at the stroke, because some work would have to be done with people to get that sorted. But they're actually in breach of the school handbook regulations 2013 and the enabling act of 2012 before it that said that parental information should be in the following format. There's, there's nothing that requires to be done other than say, excuse me, schools and authorities, do you remember we put this out? You're not doing it. So it's not a big job. Okay. Um, can I thank all the um, panel who have attended this morning for their contributions? Uh, it's um, a huge area, uh, given us a lot of food for thought this morning. I'm sure it's an area that the committee will, will return to in the future. But thank you much. Thank you very much. I'm going to suspend for five minutes or so just for a comfort break. Um, for the committee to come back. Thanks. <laughs>